This is Stuart Reed uh, with Food Co-op Initiative, and welcome everyone to, I think this is our fourth series of webinars. We've been doing this for a couple of years now with the generous support of the CDS Consulting Co-op. And uh, if you are, if this is your first time for joining us, uh, we welcome you especially. Past presentations have been recorded and are available through a link on either our website or CDS Consulting's website. So if there's a topic you're interested in, you can always go back. These webinars will also be recorded and will be available uh, at, in the future. I'm not exactly sure how long it'll take before they're posted, but they will be available. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, today Bill Gessner from CDS Consulting, who will be presenting a lot of the con today's topic, and a special guest, Sheila Conboy, who is with the East Aurora Food Co-op and has been working closely with us in, the, in helping to get their startup going. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today with all of you. Uh, the last I heard, we had over 100 people signed up to be uh, attending and part of this webinar. So thank you all. Further evidence of the continuing interest in uh, and continuing activity in the food co-ops, uh, creation of new food, food co-ops. Uh, my name is Bill Gessner. I'm with the CDS Consulting Co-op, and I've been doing uh, consulting work for I think this is my 26th year with food co-ops and uh, in the last eight or nine years working in, with uh, increasingly with a lot of startup food co-ops. It's been very exciting to see. Uh, CDS, I'm based in Minneapolis and um, CDS Consulting Co-op is a group of I think there are 21 of us that are working with food co-ops around the country. And Bill, Bill, you forgot to mention that he's also been recently nominated to the Cooperative Hall of Fame. I'm sure he was he meant to tell you that, but wow. <laughs> we want to congratulate him for that. Well, thank you, Stuart. I, I did forget about that entirely. Yes. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Um, so Stuart and I today will be the, the main presenters around this exciting topic of creating a vision. And we have a special guest with us, um, Sheila Conboy from the East Aurora Food Co-op in East Aurora, New York. Uh, Sheila, would you like to say hello? Sure. Uh, hello, uh, and thanks for this opportunity, Bill and Stuart. Seems like I was just calling you for the first time just yesterday, and here I am on a webinar. Um, I'm the project manager for the East Aurora Cooperative Market in East Aurora, New York, which is about 30 minutes southeast of Buffalo. Um, I've been with the co-op since its inception uh, in October of 2010, and um, I was the board president for about a year. And last October, uh, I stepped away from that position to become the project manager, and that's what I'm doing today. Great. Well, thank you, Sheila, and we'll, uh, we're very glad to have you with us today. And we'll, uh, as we get into our webinar, we'll have you give a little bit of an overview of your co-op and the startup project that you're part of. Uh, so our agenda here today is uh, fairly simple. The, uh, aside from our introductions here, we're, we'll kind of go through some basic uh, presentation around creating a vision. And uh, Stuart and I will comment on that and Sheila, and we may have a question or two during this first part. Uh, and then the last um, 25 minutes or so, we will have discussion and questions, and including a final five-minute period to kind of wrap up and evaluate and be done by the top of the hour. So our, um, I think you all probably saw the description of this webinar, uh, understanding the process of building a shared vision. Um, and uh, we've kind of listed some of these steps here. Uh, we the, All of the slides for the webinar today, we will not be going through them entirely, but they will be available to you as a resource um, after this webinar, as Stuart had mentioned. Um, 
so our, our desired outcome is that you will have a greater understanding of the process of, of building a shared vision within your startup food co-op. Um, it's a as you at the very beginning of your uh, formation of a food co-op, uh, vision kind of automatically comes into into the picture, into focus because as you're beginning to communicate your interest in organizing a food co-op for your community, you automatically um, um, instinctively have a vision for what that is. And the vision that you have at the very beginning is going to evolve and develop as you go forward. The model for food co-op startups that has been put forward by the Food Co-op Initiative and CDS Consulting Co-op and the National Co-op Grocers Association is, many of you are probably familiar with it, the four cornerstones and three stages. And we'll just give you a little bit of a kind of a thumbnail sketch of that today. Um, you see in this uh, diagram here the four cornerstones, the one on the top left, the first one being vision, uh, which we're going to talk about today, and then talent and capital and system. And these cornerstones are present throughout the whole development of your food co-op um, till you get to opening day and then beyond. And so as your co-op goes through its initial period and evolves, these cornerstones will be kind of an anchor for the growth of your and development of your co-op. Within those cornerstones, we see three stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage one being an organizing stage, stage two being a feasibility and planning stage, stage three being an implementation stage. So those stages, uh, stage two has actually two sub-stages, and stage three has four sub-stages. So it gets a little more complex as it goes along, but we can look at it. The, the time range for going through these stages. And we see, again, these sub-stages in stage two and in stage three. And we see a couple of lines going across here. And those are the most important aspects of this timeline, time uh, in, in the three stages these, the dotted line and the solid line, and to kind of understand the, the function of those lines, uh, they are, the way I would characterize them is that they are key decision points. As you work your way through stage one, you will have some decision points saying, do you want to, based on what you've learned so far, do you want to go further? Is there enough interest and commitment to go further? Does it appear that you might have a, a, an opportunity? If, is it feasible to go forward? As you work your way through stage one into stage two, uh, stage two ends typically when you secure a site with contingencies. That's a very important point, but you would secure a site through either a lease agreement or a purchase of an agreement, but it would be contingent upon uh, perhaps a number of things, but most importantly, contingent upon getting your financing. And so the idea is that you secure a site so that no one else can take it away from you. You, you have it for a period of time. Essentially, it's an option on a site. So you might have it a, a contingency period of three months or four months or six months. And during that time, then you go into stage 3A, where you will do finish off all of your design work and get all your financing in place. And if everything comes together as you had hoped, by the end of stage 3A, you would go back and remove those contingencies represented by the dotted line, and you would cross over the solid line between 3A and 3B. You'd cross over into the construction period. Once you do that, there's no turning back. So 
understanding those the dotted line and the solid line and what they represent is uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of that as you're beginning to get an idea of and beginning to get a vision of how your co-op is going to evolve and develop. There's some further information about these decision points for each slide, for each stage. We're not going to really look at that. And there are some suggested thresholds for number of members for each of these stages and sub-stages, assuming your store size might be uh, 6,000 square feet total. But again, the most important thing here is to to look at just simply recognizing these stages here. And you begin to see when the building of your vision will occur. And obviously, in stage one, as you're coming together as an organization, you're beginning to have a vision and communicate that to the people that are coming in here. And stage two, as you go forward to test the feasibility of your vision, uh, looking at it from the point of view of market feasibility, internal readiness, financial feasibility, and design feasibility. Uh, your vision will continue to evolve as you are learning things. Um, Sheila, I want you to, if you could uh, take a little bit of time here and uh, give us a little background on your on the East Aurora Cooperative Market and uh, maybe share a bit with how the vision, the initial vision that you had and how that's evolved to where you're at today. Sure. Uh, we started out in October 2009 with an organizational meeting that really uh, involved just four people who were uh, passionate about the idea. Um, we decided to visit the local, the co-op that we have that's nearby in Buffalo, it's about 30 minutes away, that we had uh, familiarity with, some of us have familiarity with, and that was really where our initial vision came from and uh, what we were trying to figure out if East Aurora was a community that could uh, could uh, sustain that type of uh, business plan in our community and, and for the surrounding area. And so um, we took a look at that, but we decided to have a public meeting to see if the the rest of the community would have any interest in that. So we we did uh, bring a movie, Food Inc., to the Aurora Theater in February um, to see what the, the interest level would be. And we had an informal survey and a panel discussion after that. We also showed, um, it was Food Co-op 500 at the time, which is now Food Co-op Initiative. Um, we showed a video um, that actually uh, was a short video that portrayed kind of what a food co-op does for a community. And it was usually helpful for us to convey that to people who weren't familiar with uh, co-ops. So um, that is right on the website for anyone who's interested in that. Um, what we did then was uh, went behind the scenes after we realized that this is something that the community wanted and, and were interested in. We kind of went behind the scenes to prepare uh, for a member, for a member uh, uh, gaining members for the co-op. And so we started to uh, prepare bylaws and all the documents that would be necessary to, um, to start that and make it more public. So uh, let's see, we tried to figure out a little bit about what that process would look like for us, you know, developing work groups and and how those work groups would play out to make this vision, um, you know, this uh, this vision of a of a co-op or a grocery store. Um, in October, uh, or actually in June, is when we started the membership campaign, and it was pretty successful. We were able to really convey uh, our ideas, um, and we knew that those ideas had that vision really had to be consistent. And we had some volunteers, and we needed to convey that information to the volunteers to make sure that they could then convey that to the public in a way that, that really reflected our intentions. And um, we were able to successfully do that. And by the end of October, um, we had reached the 300-member threshold. 
So, um, uh, Sheila, how many uh, people showed up at that at that first uh, public meeting that you that had? That first public meeting was very successful. It was uh, we have a uh, quite a large theater that holds uh, 600 people. We we had almost 400 people show up to the theater, and it was the day of the Olympic hockey game, which was a uh, big competition because it was about the same time. And we still had a, a huge um, sh turnout for that. Great, great. So very happy about that. Um, and then what we did, um, we started to work again a little bit behind the scenes on some of the financial things. We had a, a finance committee, a very strong one. And we started to think about the financial pro forma. And we also had the market feasibility study completed. And thanks to the Lexington Co-op who helped finance that for us. Um, so they do help with uh, the vision of your co-op, but also um, the the co-op principle of co-ops helping other co-ops. That was something that we hadn't even anticipated or envisioned, and it was a wonderful thing because it was an expensive study, and it gave provided quite a bit of information to us. Um, the it provided the information that told us what kind of store, how big a store our community could uh, could sustain. And it turned out to be 7,500 square feet with uh, about 5,000 square feet of retail is what we're, we're looking at. Um, so with that information, we were able to kind of convey that to, to the rest of the community. And they were able to, um, you know, that kind of excited them. And we were able to get more members. So we reached our 500 member threshold in May. That was a big, big deal for us. Uh, at that time, we thought we would need about 1,000 members in order to open the door. So we saw us, ourselves halfway there. Um, the thing that was a big turning point for us uh, recently, most recently, was Bill's visit um, to East Aurora back in September. And what Bill provided was a lot of insight into the process. Um, how we could get this um, this process more refined and make it so that it was more uh, we were doing things in a in a smarter, more efficient way, and that was a huge huge help. The one thing about the finance um, about the pro forma I just want to mention is that um, sometimes when you do that pro forma work and you look at your market study, it also gives you a little bit of insight into things that you might have to refine with your vision. Um, and some of your lofty ideas might have to go to the wayside for a little bit at least. Um, so you become a little bit more practical about what you might be able to spend based on the current uh, economic climate and things like being able to get a bank loan, et cetera. So right now, in stage 2B, we're working on our financial performance still because we're evaluating different sites. Um, and, and one of those sites actually wasn't part of our study. So it makes it a bit trickier. Um, we're also updating the business plan. Um, and one of the things that Bill helped us see was how important it was to uh, define the board's work as opposed to the, the work of the work groups. Um, we were spending a lot of time and energy at our board meetings on work uh, that would be considered committee work or work group work. And so that wasn't the most efficient way to go about it. And at the same time, we we're trying to become internally ready with our board, because once the store opens, we have to have a board that can function really well and really efficiently and know what its, its role actually is. So Bill helped us define the role of the board a bit better. And we were able to um, change things around a, a little so that we're trying to stave off burnout. And that has been really, really helpful so far. Um, I stepped down from the board uh, back in October. I took a leave of absence. Our, our vice president, Mary Aiken, stepped to the uh, board president role. And then uh, I became the project manager. And it, it's very structured, um, where the board uh, kind of directs me a bit. And I'm the intermediary between the board and the work groups. I oversee those work groups. And um, we go from there. And that's been a lot more efficient. And it makes a lot more sense for us. 
Um, currently, we're at 596 for our membership, and um, we're working very hard on securing a site. So those are the things that are going on currently, and will be ongoing until we do get to that uh, to that uh, dotted line. And Sheila, if you think of your vision when you first started out, and when you and Mary and others first started working on this, and 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 the the vision now that you that you hold amongst your leadership group, and even extending out into your membership, how is that? Just very briefly, is that is that still have a lot of the components of your original vision, or has it changed? Or uh, just briefly. Well, we were lucky enough to be fairly uh, congruent. Our ideas, our vision was fairly congruent. Um, it was the process that was a little bit tough. Um, I think we envisioned a different process, each of us. And um, sometimes that meant we lost a board member or we lost a volunteer or someone who we thought was going to be a very essential person in a particular work group uh, decided to bow out. And that those are the kinds of things that changed. And I think, um, you know, as we refined the process a little bit, and we were able to come together and let go of some of the preconceived notions um, that we had, um, we were able to get past that and um, retain more of our our um, essential people and our volunteers, and that helped a lot. Um, I'd say in the beginning we were very much on board. I think we've learned quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, just some of the key things were you know losing losing some board members or, or holding firm to people that you thought would be in there for the long haul and maybe they weren't. Um, some of the the solutions to that was we engaged our membership more and we were very transparent in what was going on with our membership and I think that that helps a lot in the process. Um, okay. And then when you encourage the participation of your member owners, you get more of a feel for, for what uh, the vision is really going to be. And you know that vision is going to reflect those member owners. Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you. So looking hey, at Bill, this, this is Jake. cornerstone of vision here, we can... Yes. Uh, we've had a, a couple questions come in for Sheila. Um, do we have time to, to answer one or two now, or should we save them for the end? Uh, I'd like to move on just a little bit, and then we'll come to questions in about in about five minutes here. But I want to move us just a little bit. All right, let me know. But thank you. Um, we'll get to those in just a moment. So, looking at this, uh, the cornerstone of vision, you can see some of the aspects that are involved uh, in a vision, um, and the idea of distinguishing between your own individual vision and the idea of building a shared vision over time. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen in one day. It happens over time. We look to some of the key ingredients to building a shared vision over time. Uh, we can see, you know, try to be visual in your thinking. What will the co-op and the store look like in three years and in ten years? Uh, don't get too attached to that, but try to bring forth a, a visual image, not just a lofty goal. Um, and to really try to have a, a, a learning environment in your co-op where you're, where you're through education and study, you are, uh, as a group, you are open to learning and stretching. Um, certainly it's a very challenging process to, to form a uh, food co-op. And it can be very helpful to look at models. You know, what is the model? Uh, or models that your co-op aspires to. Uh, we heard Sheila talk about the Lexington Co-op in Buffalo, New York, and how that was a model and has been inspiring as well as supportive of their efforts. Um, container. What is the what is a container that will hold this shared vision? And what is a container that will hold your work together as you try to realize your vision? Uh, the four cornerstones and three stages model is a container of sorts. And if your food co-op is like any of the other food co-ops, your food co-op will resist such a container. But it's your job as leaders to try to create a container to nurture and build your, your co-op. 
what is the process and that your group is using to build a shared vision and does your shared vision include just the end outcome or does your shared vision do you have a vision of the process it's important that your vision not just be of the end outcome but that also visualize the process of how you're going to get there and that you have a shared vision of how you're going to get there. And then through lots of dialogue and discussion, are you building agreement over time? And a reality check as you begin to get into the feasibility work, is your vision realistic and how will you test it? So these are some of the key ingredients. And now, Jake, I would like to, we'd like to hear a question for Sheila. Great. Uh, we had a question come in from Matt Steele of uh, Kensington Food Co-op uh, about, uh, Sheila, did you offer incentive for members who bought in before doors opened? You know, we, we did um, offer an incentive, which I don't know, um, and Bill will obviously comment on this. I don't think if we could do it all over again, we may have done this because I don't know that it was the right way to go about it. but. We couldn't come to an agreement amongst our board members as to the dollar amount for member equity. Um, so what we did was a compromise, and we we decided that the first 500 members would come in at $150, um, and then after we hit the 500 mark, we would raise that to $200, and it would stay at that level from that point out. Uh, the benefit was that we did reach the 500 relatively quickly, um, and Bill could probably speak a little bit better to the, um, the disadvantages or the idea behind not doing that. Uh, because I think when we mentioned to Bill, I wasn't real certain he was on board with that idea, but unfortunately we had already started that process. Yeah. So it's an interesting uh, approach. I, I'm, I certainly have some reservations about that type of an idea. And the danger is where you're, where, and I don't think you've really done that here, but because in effect, what you've done is maybe discounted your your membership share for the initial members, um, <clears throat> but it the danger of trying to create different levels of me <clears throat> member equity um, is I think can really cause problems over time. So I wouldn't necessarily endorse that as a best practice. Uh, some groups will give premiums or a, you know a bag or a t-shirt or something like that uh, something like that I think is is workable but um, I think the real challenge is to sell your vision to your community and if people want that they will recognize the importance of their equity investment to help make that happen but the question wasn't necessarily for me, it was for Sheila. So. <laughs> but I, I can definitely uh, reiterate what Bill said, that the vision, when you start to talk to potential member owners, their questions are, where is it going to be? They want to envision that, and they want a clear, concise idea of what that would be. And I would say that that's probably one of the most important things, is to make sure that you're consistent and um, and uh clear on that vision before you get it out there and you make sure everyone that's talking about the co-op has that same idea in mind. And, and, and I think as you do that, it's even important to convey that, you know, this is the vision that you have at this point and as you learn more, you will you'll be refining that and, and evolve, the vision will evolve. Um, so it's, you know, you can't you know, we've seen situations where some co-ops want to start out and they have a grand vision of wanting to do quite a number of things and provide a lot of products and services and to be able to do it in a, you know, in a, let's say 1,500 square feet. And uh, when they get to trying to lay all that out, it doesn't really quite work. And then they all of a sudden they're looking at a 5,000 square foot store. Or it can be the other way around. They're looking at a uh, 15,000 square foot store supermarket for their community and they find the difficulty of trying to make that happen. So then they have, end up with a smaller size. So it can change over time. 
great. There was in, a, one... in a, uh, addition to these, key, in addition to these key ingredients um, for building a shared vision, there are some challenges to that, and I'd like to ask Stuart Reed to talk a little bit about those, and then we will uh, probably have some time for additional questions. Stuart, sure. These. Um, Building a vision is, is, is probably one of the most difficult parts of organizing a co-op. Um, and there's a, challenge, a lot of challenges because every group is composed of the people that come forward and are willing to help and support it. And you don't necessarily have control over the visionaries, the leaders, and the followers. Uh, you, you get who you get. And so I think you have to be careful that you have a find ways in which you can talk about your vision together and come to that unified idea of what is it we want to accomplish? What is our store there for? What need are we addressing? Those key questions, there has to be some unity on it. And while input is incredibly important, it has to at some point become our vision that doesn't change that much. The core vision is out there, and new people coming in, new ideas coming in, we're not going to revisit the whole thing. We're not going to start over from scratch. We have a vision of what our store is. It, it, there are some groups that I've encountered that have felt that everybody's input at whatever stage of organizing they were at had to be taken into account, and they spend more time explaining and justifying and rebuilding consensus than they do moving forward. So be cautious of that. It's, it's good to listen. It's good to hear what people want, what they uh, are interested in. But when you do have, if you have a really valuable, viable vision, boy, I'm alliterative today, the, uh, that should carry you all the way through without having to, to go back and revisit it unless you run into the wall where they absolutely discover that your project can't go forward as you planned, and then you do have to revisit the core concept. So I, I think that, that that would be my big caveat. Uh, be cautious, but trust that vision once you have it. Okay. Another thing that some groups will encounter and have a little bit of difficulty with is a desire to start looking at the operational aspects of their vision. Um, looking ahead too far, in other words. Your vision for the co-op has to include how big is it going to be to do what we want to do, but it doesn't have to include, at least in the early stages, which product lines and which vendors and, and how much are we going to pay the staff. Those are questions that go beyond vision into the actual operations at the store and, and are better set aside until you get a little closer to open. So those are my caveats. I'll turn it back over to the questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jake, do you have another question? Uh, there was a question about um, if you could elaborate on the container. I'm not sure um, it was clear what the container for the vision is. Yeah. I think the idea of a container is it's a little hard to to grasp that sometimes, but I think any anything new that is being formed is going to have a better chance to develop and develop successfully if there's if there's some type of container around it. And that, that container is probably invisible um, in many ways, but as a group is working together, you're in effect creating a safe place to nurture the development of your co-op. And without such a container, your vision can spill all over the place. So if you begin to, for example, using the four cornerstones and three stages model and taking your project, your specific your unique, your special project, and putting it into that model and say, how are we going to move through the different stages? And how are we going to make sure we have each of these four cornerstones 
growing and evolving through each stage, that gives you a structure to do your development work, and that structure provides a container. So I would encourage you to try to think of it in that in that way. And as I think the more you do, the container becomes more apparent. So. Great. Do you have time for other questions right now? Uh, we're going to, I'm going to do a couple more slides here and then we're going to open it up to questions. I want to talk a little bit about the moving from 20% to 80%. And I like to uh, talk with groups and say, well, everybody coming together into the leadership group or the steering committee of a co-op, they probably have their own individual vision of what the co-op is going to be like in five years or ten years. But the question is, how much of those individual visions are a shared vision? And at the beginning, uh, as you work through this, it wouldn't be surprising if maybe uh, as much or as little as 20 percent of those individual visions are shared. But what you're needing to work towards is to get to the point where, you know, at least 80% of those individual visions are shared. And this is something that happens gradually. So thinking of where you're at today and measuring that in some fashion and saying where will you be at three months from now or six months from now or a year from now with your group in terms of having a shared vision. And there are some exercises you can do about this and you can, I mean, people can write up on a one page or one to two pages maximum what they, what their actual visual image of the co-op is going to be like in, let's say, five years or ten years. And people can come together and they can share their individual write-ups and everybody reads through the other person's and then you can do a with a flip chart or a chalkboard, you can kind of list all the things that are in common, and you can list the things that are that are different. And the things that are different are that's okay, especially at the early stage. But you want to you want to kind of sort it out and see where are the commonalities and where are the differences, and then work over time to move some of those things that where there are differences, move them over onto the common shared side. So. Kind of keeping that image in mind, I think, can be very helpful as you do your do your work. And here we see some groups in kind of planning work or visioning type of work here. Um, so as you build a shared vision, you know, will your will your vision be feasible? Um, and uh, the feasibility work comes in and begins to kind of test this and what you learn from the feasibility work will help you help your vision evolve even further after you've done a market study after you've done a financial performa things are much more specific and grounded and much less lofty and less ideal uh, and then as you work through the visioning session visioning work this is as Stuart was saying, distinguishing between the visioning work and the planning for operations. As you begin to move from vision to what I call concept, and then that concept the core of your business plan. That's the operational planning. Um, so what we're really talking about at this stage is the, is the vision type of work. Building a shared vision happens from the inside out from your core group, from your core leadership group, building a shared vision there, and then taking that out to your members, communicating it, testing it, gaining feedback. Rather than going to all your members at the beginning and say, hey, folks, what do you think we should do? Uh, the leadership responsibility that you have to craft a vision and build a vision and then take that out and present that to your members is I think the better approach being fluid and flexible while staying true to your values and your guiding principles building a shared vision from the inside out 
another way to look at this is risk and comfort. Um, as the leadership group of your of your co-op, you know, is working on building a shared vision, what level of risk are you comfortable with? Uh, and you know, what is the comfort level? What would make you more comfortable with the risk that your co-op is taking? So through study, through investigation and learning, dialogue and team building type of work, you can build the comfort level with the amount of risk that you're taking. But it's really good to go through and assess that and recognize that you're likely going to be taking on you know, significant debt through this process where you have this vision, where you have these wonderful ideas, but it's you know, the risk that you're taking is, is important to integrate into your vision work. And then my last comment here, I think, for the moment would be to think about commitment and developing and building commitment, but without attachment. Um, the challenge is to build a commitment without becoming attached to a specific outcome. Uh, and there's kind of a paradox there where, where, where you want to find a way to build your commitment and, in a certain sense, being detached. And this is a very difficult thing for a lot of people to bring together these two notions. But given the challenge of forming a food co-op and that it can take, you know, on a, on a fast track, take three years to get doors open. Um, you really need, you, you'll be tested throughout that process and your commitment level needs to continue to build or you won't make it through that. But if you get attached, to, overly attached to something at the very beginning, it turns out not to be workable for one reason or another, that can really seriously disrupt or you know, knock your group off of the off of the track that it is on. So the challenge of the, the tests and the hurdles that you need to clear um, as you work through your startup process, if you can have a successful process, that's going to speak that's going to really help you be successful once you get your doors open. So again, part of the vision that you shared vision that you're trying to create is a vision not just of the end outcome but of the process. So I think with that I would like to open up some questions and Jake. Yeah, this message comes in from Adam Schwartz. Uh, is your in your experience are startup food co-ops contacting other co-ops in their community, such as credit unions or farm co-ops, for support and advice? Uh, not very often. Uh, I, I think it's just for them to be contacting nearby food co-ops is and building a, an appropriate relationship there is. A number of startup groups are doing that, but that's a, that's a big undertaking. And there's a lot of subtleties to that. And, you know, you don't just go and say, hey, what can you do for us? But it's building a relationship. And the same thing would apply to other types of co-ops in your community. And they will be even more challenging and more difficult to build those relationships. But I think it's, it can be very important and it can help, help you build your vision and build your visibility throughout your community if you can link with those other potential strategic partners. Uh, Stuart, do you, would you like to comment uh, on this? Uh... Yeah, I think I better, otherwise people are going to wonder what this picture is. Um, what you're looking at here is a World War II era Quonset hut. And the reason I've got this here is just a, an example of this was the inspiration for a co-op on the East Coast. They did not have one in their community, and this business was for sale, and they said, oh, my goodness, this would be perfect for our co-op. 
Well, you can imagine that this is not an ideal situation probably for any kind of a grocery store. It's fairly, very small in, in terms of its available space and not in very good condition and all kinds of issues that come with a corrugated metal building. But that group did take that starting point and with good insight from themselves and some outside expertise to help them think about their vision. They, they now have a viable vision of a real store, <clears throat> a, a store that can really meet the needs of their community that will probably look a little different from this one that's ready. But, so you know, where you start from isn't necessarily where you end, but uh, be cautious of that, that you do have the, the input you need to make that vision a real viable one. Thanks, Stuart. I think that's a really great example of uh, pictures worth uh, quite a few words in that case. Other questions? Uh, not at this time. Jake, were there any other questions? No, Bill. No other questions right now. OK. Um, so the, we, we can show you some examples of tools that you can think of as tools for building a shared vision um, throughout your co-op. This is just kind of a brainstorming list. I'm sure there are many more things here. But these are tools that you can use to build a shared vision. Uh, it includes your you know, looking at community organizing, the, the informational meetings like the public meeting that the East Aurora Co-op had to kind of launch their their effort. Uh, but there are all kinds of... One of the uh, other things we did, Bill, was um, when we first started meeting as a board and trying to create the vision and we were in the midst of writing our business plan and had to write a vision statement, we all wrote down different things and then kind of brought them to the table to see where the similarities were. But we also brought pictures, just uh, images of either other co-ops or other grocery stores to kind of give an, a flavor as to what we we're all after and just to see if we were on the same page. And those were helpful tools as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to add to that pictures idea that I think that for a lot of people, it, it makes the vision much more real to be able to see use your vision to see pictures. And as you start uh, getting an idea of what you want your co-op to be, if you can have pictures from other established co-ops to show people as examples, it can really be a valuable way to, to proceed. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Um, here's a, a slide where you can look at the idea of building a shared vision with all stakeholders, including your internal stakeholders and your external stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders being people or organizations that have a stake in your success. And developing relationships with those stakeholders, building a base of stakeholders, both internal to the organization and external, uh, that are that are and become invested in your success. And so <clears throat> the food co-op community is quite extensive and regionally and nationally, and there's quite a strong commitment to one of the cooperative principles, including cooperation amongst cooperatives. And increasingly, the existing food co-ops are dedicating resources to help support uh, startup food co-ops, uh, either in their region or maybe in a whole different part of the country. I, I know the Berkshire Co-op in Massachusetts has uh, provided strong support to co-ops in you know, New Orleans and Ohio and, and uh, you know, all over the place just because of relationships that have been built. Um, so this is a list to kind of go through and say, what is your approach to building relationships with stakeholders and strategic partners. Um, vision and time. You know, as you develop a vision for your food co-op, both individual and shared, what will that vision be in three months? What will it be in six months? What will that vision be in a year? 
and if this is like testing whether you need glasses or not, uh, uh, you know, what will it be in the distant future where it's harder to see? Um, and an alternate way of looking at this would be to recognize that your vision today is relatively small uh, compared to 10 and 20 and 50 and 100 years out, if your seed can take root and grow and think of the impact that your community-based, community-owned cooperative organization can have uh, and the number of people it can touch deeply and significantly over a three and five and 10 and 50 year period of time. There are some specifics we have here in the slides, including size and scope. How do you begin thinking of that for your food co-op? Uh, a market study will help you with that. Uh, beginning to envision size of a building, uh, thinking roughly two-thirds of that space for retail. What is What kind of departments are you going to have? Is it going to be some of the perishable departments have lots of complexity to them? What type of equipment? What is the size of that budget? What is the quality of the building and the, and the equipment? So even this work here, I mean, the, this the visioning work that is, was done very early on gets to this point where you're getting very specific about store planning. Yeah. Some minimum considerations, you know, that you would probably want to be able to have a market study that projects at minimally $500 per retail square foot per in your initial year and growing to $1,000 per retail square foot. Here we see some visual images that help you, again, see more specifically what is involved here. <clears throat> we have some estimates on cost considerations, very rough estimates in terms of what it would be for new construction or the existing building upfit, equipment and inventory putting all the costs together, including soft costs <clears throat> and, and working capital allowance, you can easily end in a range of $250 to $300 per square foot in today's dollar. What kind of management structure will you have? What about staff wages and benefits? And then uh, a food co-op is more than a grocery store. And balancing the co-op and the business so that you can become a successful cooperative business over time. Uh, but in the beginning, the focus needs to be on being successful as a business so that you will have the resources to fulfill the mission and the ends that the co-op is aspiring to. But even in the beginning, the food co-op is more than a grocery store. And you can, one of the ways I like to think of the cooperative advantage is to saying your membership really, membership just doesn't equal discount as it used to in the olden days. Uh, I think of it as a membership equaling ownership, membership equaling economic advantage, and membership equals service to the community. And Stuart, would you like to comment a little bit here? Yeah, I threw this in. It's a, I just discovered this particular illustration recently, but I think it's a really nice way of looking at the triple bottom line concept, which a lot of co-ops, uh, all co-ops, I would say, are, are committing to. And sometimes it's phrased differently, um, you know, public, private, and, and community. Um, but the social aspect is, is the people, of course, and you've got the environment and your economic need. You can't None of these are independent in a cooperative. You can't do anything for the society or the environment if you're not economically successful. And likewise, you could see how they interlapse between social and economic, what's equitable. 
what what do we want to return to the community? What do we need to retain in the co-op? You know, there's a balancing act there. There's another val balancing act between what's viable in terms of the, what you can do for the environment to protect it and to serve versus what you need to be able to do to be, to be successful as a business. All of these things have interplays. The place where everything comes together in the middle is sustainability. And it's one of the toughest jobs in the world to manage a food co-op. It's harder even than it is for you guys to organize a food co-op, I think. Managing a food co-op requires that you're always trying to balance the needs of all of these stakeholders in a way that's equitable and sustainable. And it's not an easy thing. But this is what why what we do is so important and why it makes a difference and why those of us who are doing it are so committed to what we do. So uh, some food for thought to end on here. Thank you, Stuart. That's really great. Um, so if you all have questions, um, please contact us, either through the questions here on the webinar uh, toolbar or through our contact information. Uh, we'll be glad to hear from you about this. And the recording uh, and the materials for these sessions will be available. And we invite you to join us for future webinars next week, uh, creating priorities and building alignment for each stage. We will, I will work with Jeannie Wells, and we will kind of continue the, the discussion here looking at the container that we talked about, the structure, the, the three stages, and how do you work through that? How do you prioritize and, and build alignment and focus going through those stages? And we have Jake uh, involved doing a webinar on January 24th, Technology Toolkit, and then starting a new buying club, and effective boards and teams. So. And just a reminder that each of these webinars does require a separate um, registration and at the same wonderful price of free. So, but you do need to sign up for each one independently. And typically we have a, do we have an evaluation process for this webinar? Uh, yeah, we, I believe that there was an omission of putting that together ahead of time, but since we do have your uh, contact information from signing up for the, the webinars, that we will be trying to send out a brief uh, evaluation survey in the next week and really appreciate any feedback you give us. We use it to plan our future events and make sure that we're doing a good job for you. So please, please respond if you can. Also, if, as long as I've got a second here, I'd like to remind people, too, that if you aren't already on our, our uh, mailing list for Food Co-op Initiative, that's one way to make sure you're getting a notice about these webinars and any of the other training events that we put on. So uh, if you go to our website, it's really easy to sign up. We don't ask for a lot of information. and encourage you to do that. So I'd like to thank Sheila Convoy from the East Aurora Cooperative Market in East Aurora, New York. Google them, look at their website, East Aurora Cooperative Market. And thank you, Sheila, for being with us. Thanks a lot, Bill. And uh, Stuart, I'll let you have the final word. Well, the final word is simply to thank Bill and uh, for helping to get this all put together and uh, another fine webinar. We look forward to joining most of you again in, in the coming weeks. And uh, you can invite all your friends to join us as well. So thanks a lot, folks, and uh, be in touch. Thank you.